Welcome back to part three of our podcast series on the Italian resistance. If you haven't listened to our previous parts yet, I suggest you go back and listen to those first. Alla mattina, appena alzata, oh bella ciao, bella ciao, bella ciao, 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 alla mattina. Before we get started, just a quick reminder that our podcast is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Our supporters fund our work and in return get exclusive early access and ad-free podcast episodes, bonus episodes, free and discounted merchandise and other content. For example, our Patreon supporters can listen to all parts of this series now. Patreon supporters also have access to three bonus episodes for this series, covering post-war anti-fascism as well as discussions about films and music of the Italian resistance. Join us or find out more at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory, link in the show notes. We've also produced a range of merch commemorating the Italian resistance and our theme tune, Bella Ciao. And as a listener to the podcast, you get a 10% discount off that and other items in our online shop using the discount code WCHPODCAST, link in the show notes. As a content note for our listeners, it should be pointed out that this episode contains some descriptions of torture and sexual violence. When we left the story at the end of the last episode, the major cities of northern Italy had been liberated by partisans, while Mussolini had been captured, executed, and his body hung on display up in a Milan square. However, while fascism looked like it was down and out, things would change very quickly in the years following the war. And part of the reason for this was in the divisions between different partisan groups themselves, as Davide from Cronaca Ribelli explained to us. The Italian resistance was quite a complex and it, we can say even divided movement. The only thing that kept them together was fighting fascism. There were really different units. And the Communist Party, who, was the, who had most support, who maintained some kind of underground structure, of course, organized most of the fighters. Uh, communists were organized in the so-called Garibaldi uh, divisions. There were also a lot of um, socialists uh, who, were, um, who formed this division were called uh, Justizia Libertà. Uh, so they were like socially inspired. They, they took the example of the Rosselli brothers who were killed in France a few years earlier. But we also had anarchist groups. We had uh, what we can call, in Italy we call them Badogliane, because they were quite kind of really loyal to the government in the south of Italy. Uh, they were like loyal to the king. They were monarchists. So division were quite, you know, as I said, quite important. And, uh, and this was also uh, what caused a lot of division between themselves. We caused a, a lot of episodes. So like episodes where partisans actually shoot other partisans. Uh, it was a complex phenomenon. Even uh, the, the relationship with allies was complex. Uh, there's an example we use for that. It's the so-called Proclama Alexander. So Alexander was the general, the English, the British general was commanding the, 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 the allied forces in Italy. Uh, when in 1944, in late in, um, in the fall, 1944, they just they recognized that they will not come up and get to Berlin from Munich, you know, from the south through the Alps. And the front was open in the north through the Normandy landings, and they were just advancing, you know, from Belgium and from the, and from the border with France, they just say to all parties, I mean, they made a, a, a public you know, announcement saying, uh, you know what, we're just getting on the fence in Italy for the winter, and just don't do anything stupid. They just said something like that. Do not attack. Do not make, you know, offensive which was a disaster for all the partisans, because when the, the German knew that the Allies were not coming from the south, they used the whole winter to just, you know, attack partisans, uh, to, to destroy their autonomous areas. And uh, that's a clear example of how complex and uh, even uneven was the relationship, of course, between the Allies and, um, and the partisans. A useful way of thinking about these divisions was put forward by the historian and former partisan Claudio Pavone. He argued that the resistance was actually made up of three distinct but overlapping wars. A patriotic war, in which Italy was fighting to liberate itself from German occupation. A civil war, not just against German occupation, but a popular progressive struggle against Italian fascism. And a class war, in which the workers and peasants, whose organisations had been smashed by fascists, 
fought against those bosses and big landowners who had benefited from, and in many cases actively supported, fascism. However, this doesn't just mean that different groups were fighting different wars. Rather, for Pavone, all groups, and even individuals, fought some combination of the three wars simultaneously, even if those wars contradicted each other. The useful thing about Pavone's categories is that they help highlight the tensions within the resistance that would get worse as the end of the war got closer, sometimes even between rank and file partisans and the leaders of their parties. Similar tensions existed between some partisan groups and the Allied armies. For instance, when the Allies arrived during the liberation of Florence, they came with an order for the Communist Garibaldi division to disband. The order came directly from General Harold Alexander, the same general that Davide just mentioned, who, a few months later, would make the proclamation standing down Allied troops. The Garibaldi partisans refused to disband and set up roadblocks, declaring that, quote, anybody who came to impose the surrender of weapons gained from the enemy through so much blood would themselves be treated as an enemy, end quote. These kinds of tensions only got worse as liberation drew nearer, and the question of what to do with captured fascists became more pressing. Many of them were arrested. Some of them were executed, were executed by partisans. This, that's the same fate that Mussolini had. He was, you know, trying to flew to Switzerland, uh, just, you know, dressed as a, as a German soldier, and he was just trying to get away when he was captured, and killed in a few hours. Why they... Did they do that? Because they knew that if he fell uh, in, especially, specifically, British hands, probably he was not, you know, he could still have a role in post-war Italy. Uh, this was their provision, their, 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 what they imagined. And that's what happened, actually. Because if many were killed on the spot, uh, I feel many of them, even later, in the, in the first months, and then later, as we'll see probably later, um, Many of them just escaped or were captured and were freed in a, in a matter of months. This wasn't just a hypothetical concern. For instance, as fighting raged around the Fiat factory during the liberation of Turin, one of the directors, Vittorio Valletta, made his escape. Fiat management had long collaborated with both fascists and Nazis, making huge profits from producing military vehicles and also identifying workers' leaders for deportation to concentration camps. But by the end of 1943, Fiat bosses could see how the war was going. They made contact with the OSS, which was the forerunner to the CIA, and even started donating money to groups within the resistance. As such, when Turin was liberated and the Piedmont Committee of National Liberation, or CLN, put out a warrant for Valletta's arrest as a Nazi collaborator, Valletta, a fascist party member since 1930, instead turned up in a villa under British protection for his, quote, meritorious commitment to the Allied cause, end quote. The reason for this, of course, was that as World War II was ending, the Cold War was just getting started, and the defeated fascists would become useful once again. This was true in many places, but especially in Italy, where the Communist Party had been so important to the resistance, and after the war became a mass working-class party. By 1946, the party boasted 1.6 million members, about two-thirds of whom were manual labourers. By 1948, membership was over 2 million, which out of a total population of around 46 million meant that 1 in 23 Italians were members of the Communist Party. And of course, given recent history, tens of thousands of these members, at least, would have been armed. As such, the mood among rank-and-file partisans was understandably buoyant after the war. But this mood would not last long, as Davide explains. The feeling after the joy for the liberation, because they had, I mean, the end of April and all May was about joy, you know, the war was over, people stopped being killed everywhere, uh, bombing stopped. That lasted for a few weeks. Uh, after that, they started to understand that something was going on, that those people who were like committing those crimes, not only since 1943, but since 1919, you know, when the fascist movement arose and started, you know, attacking workers, attacking unions, attacking, uh, you know, Lega Contadina, you know, the organization of agricultural workers in the countryside. So th that started to, you know, change that feeling into suspicion and anger. Of course, most of it, uh, I mean, it became clear only after the Togliatti amnesty, which was the marking point 
of uh, the, the made clear the fact that, you know what, fascists, the 99% of them just won't pay nothing for the crimes and also they're just going to be back into the courts, into the communi, into the ministers, into the army. Just like that. Just nothing happened. You know what? Here they are again. They then, I mean, then we had another step, which was the political uh, return of fascism with the creation of the Movimento Sociale Italiano. In 1946, Italy became a republic after the population voted in a referendum to abolish the monarchy, which had been tainted by its support for fascism. It also established its first elected government in over two decades, led by the right wing Christian Democrats and with ministerial positions given to the Socialist and Communist Parties. The leader of the Communist Party, Palmiro Togliatti, was made Minister of Justice, and the Togliatti amnesty that Davide mentioned was the name of the amnesty he passed for acts carried out during the Nazi occupation up to the 31st of July 1945. The idea was that political crimes and acts of violence carried out during the war would be pardoned, except for those defined as heinous or carried out by officials considered high-ranking. For reasons we'll discuss later, the law outraged many former partisans. However, there was a logic to it in a country desperate to return to normality after five years of war and two decades of dictatorship. As such, many partisans supported the amnesty, including Alfredo Schiavi. You see, Italy at the time was fascist as a whole, except for a few. But all the administration, judges, they were all fascists. So if you'd send them to jail, who could have ruled Italy? Who would have worked in the Italian administration? The Togliatti amnesty was an act of goodwill from the communists towards the fascists. Can you imagine if all the employees and managers of the Minister of Economy were shot or put in jail? Indeed, many partisans fought against this amnesty and many communists decided to fight against Italy after 1945. But many then changed again their minds and nothing came out of it. Was it the right thing to do? Probably yes. Yes, this gave fascists a new opportunity, like in the case of the Movimento Sociale Italiano. I remember that Vittorio Foa, a comrade and a friend in Turin, was a senator. He met an MSI senator and he told him, if you had won, we would have ended up in jail, but we won. And here you are, in Parliament. Alfredo here is referring to when socialist politician Vittorio Foa met fascist politician Giorgio Pisano in the Italian Senate. Foa had spent eight years in fascist prisons before becoming a partisan. Pisano, meanwhile, was twice awarded the Nazi Iron Cross after volunteering for the Italian Social Republic's Decipa Mass Military Corps and the Black Brigade's paramilitary organisation, both of which were implicated in numerous war crimes. Other partisans, meanwhile, fiercely opposed the amnesty, particularly rank-and-file communists, many of whom continued to carry out revenge attacks for some years after the war, as we'll discuss in part four. Their reasons for opposing the amnesty were clear. Let's think about the administration, bureaucracy, and especially the army. They were just put back in their position in the years following the war. Uh... The key, uh, the, the, the thing that probably had more consequences was, you know, the law. The judges that uh, worked in, the Ita- in Italy between already 45, 46, 47 and so on, they were all fascist judges. And of course, this had uh, important consequences if you think that those were the years where you had to, to you know, to organize trials against uh, most of the fascists, uh, against those partisans who committed crime, uh, etc. And of course, their judgment uh, was not an evil one. This issue had serious implications for the amnesty. After the war, many of the judges who had spent the past 20 years, in some cases their whole careers, administering fascist laws, were now simply back in their old positions. And now it was these judges who would interpret which, and more importantly, whose crimes would benefit from the amnesty. I'll give you an extent if you want numbers. So Italy had 43,000 trials, with 6,000 people who were condemned at first. Now, this says uh, at a time Italy had around like 41, 42 million people 
living in it. To in order to you know to 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 understand uh, how bad it is, we we can like compare it to Norway. Norway, which was uh, a country with uh, that had a little more than three million people, had eighteen thousand people condemned for killing you know collaboration government. Denmark fourteen thousand five hundred on uh, less than four millions. In France, uh, at the time, uh, there were like 50 million people, more or less. They had 170,000 trials, and three out of four ended up with someone declared guilty. So it is, you know, when you, when you do the math, uh, you can compare what happened to Italy uh, compared to, to what happened in other countries. Even someone who had a really slightly, you know, short time uh, occupation, like France, I mean, we're talking about four, four years between 1940 and 1944. There was those who carried out some of the most brutal acts during the war. This is part of it. And I'm focusing about 1943, 1945, but in the lot, we had people who were responsible for massacres in Libya, in Ethiopia, in Somalia, in Greece, in Yugoslavia. These people were not Persecuted, and when those the, the post-war states like Greece or Yugoslavia they ask to Italy, you know, get, I mean, they did horrible things. They massacred hundreds and hundreds of people, just like that. We we want to trial them. Italy said no, and for the same reason, did not ne- never chase the Germans who were responsible for crimes in Italy in those years. In Italy, we call that uh, baratto delle colpe, which is like exchange of guilties. You know, I don't care about you, and so you can, you don't ask uh, questions about that. So Togliatti, who was the Minister of Justice at the time, created this law, the Togliatti Amnesty, uh, which actually said something like, those who just committed, you know, were responsible for heinous crime, they are the one who shall not get the amnesty. But when it comes to the other, you know what? Yeah, we can like forgive them somehow. Uh, the point is that that didn't work like that. I mean, <laughs> it was about the law and judges to um, and to their you know their personal point of view to understand what he news meant. This was horrible. I mean, there have been rapes, mass rapes uh, that were followed by torture who were not considered he news. Uh, there was a case, and I was reading this amazing book, which is uh, La Missia Togliatti by Mimo Franzinelli, uh, where they described as this guy who was like beaten on his genitals. He was burned. He was like, they were, they just took off his nails, you know, from his fingers. And then uh, this, that, this happened in Padua. And then they moved him, they put him on a truck, and they moved him in, in Abano Terme, which is like 10 minutes away from Padua. And since he was put on a truck and moved to a town which was just next to, he said, yeah, he could move. So what he felt, it was not that bad in the end if he could have, you know, moved in another town after that. So the one who was, the guy who was responsible for that didn't, he just got the amnesty and went off in 1948. Uh, this is this is just an example. There are dozens and dozens, and they're all the same. You know, we have um, Gaetano Azzariti. Gaetano Azzariti was uh, the president of the Commissione sulla Razza, uh, which I can roughly translate on race committee. Hmm? Uh, that was, uh, you know, to judge people uh, that were considered of a lower, you know, race, uh, Jews. Somalis, Libyans who were, who were in Italy, this, this kind of this kind of people, uh, Slavic people. Uh, this guy, did, I mean, not only was freed with the amnesty, but he became the second president of the Corte Costituzionale in Italy, which is like the Supreme Court in the US. Just to make it was the second one. Okay, this guy. It, it's not that he just you know went back and walked in in his little town, and that it was the president of the Supreme Court. It's like. Four more, in pers- more important pe- person in Italy. I'll give you another example with that, of that. We have Aldo Vidussoni. He was the secretary of the National Fascist Party. Okay? So, he had some role in the regime. And he was just freed because uh, uh, following the sentence, there is, is uh, yes, a sentence in the, in the trial he had, you know, his, his role was not enough, you know, to keep him, to consider him responsible for what fascism did. He was the secretary of the fascist party 
in the last years of fascism. I mean, <laughs> it is, there's nothing else you can say about that. Um, the Banda Carita, another one, the Banda Carita, it was this, they were responsible of heinous crime, they tortured partisans, they killed people on the spot. All of them, they were out by 1953. All of them. Luciano Luberti, he was called the Boya of Albanga, the executioner of Albanga, which is a small town in Liguria. He, he wrote his memories where, like, you know, he liked to shoot people right in the face and, uh, and to torture, to kill. He, he's, like, responsible for 100 or so killings, something like that. Uh, he, was, he went out in 1953. He killed again. The girl was working with him. He kept writing books about how fascism was good. And I'll just let you know that he worked with Nazis because fascists of Liguria, they didn't want to work with him because it was violent. And this was the opinion of all the fascists. And this guy went out in 1953. So <laughs> here we are. These are just some examples of what the Togliatianists did, or what people went out. So it was not just, you know, make the state walk, make the state walk. It was something more. It was another level. It would be impossible for us to cover the sheer extent of fascist brutality or individual war criminals that went unpunished because of the amnesty. But one person that deserves mention is a man called Junior Valerio Borghese. Born into a Tuscan noble family, he was commander of the Decima Mass Military Corps mentioned earlier. Under his command, the regiment had 800 documented murders to its name, as well as the looting and burning of entire villages and the torture of hundreds of partisans. As was often the case, the man presiding over Borghese's appeal was himself a fascist, not to mention also a family friend, and when Borghese's release was announced, the courthouse broke out in fascist salutes. Borghese is important because he would return as a sinister actor in Italian politics decades later. As such, Borghese indicates not just the kinds of people and past crimes that went unpunished because of the amnesty, but also what the amnesty would enable in the future. We'll come back to Borghese when we eventually finish our series on the Italian struggles of the 60s and 70s. But in the meantime, not only were fascists like Borghese pardoned, but former partisans were frequently harassed and persecuted. There's something we have to point out, uh, apart from the, the fact that, that we did that judges were fascists, you know, and they treated anti-fascists as they did before. But the, the Corte di Cassazione, which is like the judicial higher court in Italy, they just decided that partisans' crime were to be treated as common crimes. While, you know, fascists were uh, war crimes, we should were then amnestied with the Togliatti amnesty. Uh, so that's, that, 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 that gives you an example of on how people, how things were, were, um, were treated when it came to partisans. Uh, I think the better thing to do uh, about that is to, to give a number, at first, so the amnesty even you know conserved some partisans actually who were judged as war crime, and, but it was like the six seven percent of the, the people who got the amnesty, so nothing. And then I have to I, I, I'll give you to the story of two people and to make you understand uh, how this worked. First of all, Belgrado Pedrini. Belgrado Pedrini was an anarchist, and uh, he was from Carrara, which is like the birthplace of Italian anarchism. Carrara is the centre of the Italian marble industry, and from the late 19th century, the city's marble quarry workers formed the epicentre of the Italian anarchist movement. While in most of Italy, anarchists largely joined the partisan formations of other left-wing organisations, Carrara and the surrounding area was one of the few places where anarchists were strong enough to maintain their own battalions. One such formation was the Lucetti Battalion, named after the anarchist Gino Lucetti, who tried to assassinate Mussolini in 1926. We discussed the Lucetti Battalion and their song, Dai Monti di Sarzana, in our bonus episode about the music which came out of the resistance, available exclusively for Patreon supporters. In 1944, Carrara was liberated by partisans. The Italian Anarchist Federation seized the town hall in the central square, which still serves as its headquarters today. Belgrado Pedrini was involved in the movement there. In 1942, yeah, just before the armistice, he, he was still in Carrara and he shot to to the fastest poly, uh, police. He killed one, then he escaped, then he was captured, and he was put in prison. He was freed after the armistice and kept fighting. And then he was arrested by the Republican Italy. And he remained in prison until the 70s. It was like three, three or four years before his death. 
uh, so that's uh, if you if you compare it with you know fascist war criminals who, who got away in '53 when there was a second amnesty that just you know wiped them all out and yeah everyone's free and okay I'll give another example of that there was this teacher Clara Marchetto was her name she was from uh, Sud Tirol from actually Trent, Trentino not Sud Tirol and um, she managed she was trying to contact the French army. To give them the plans for the new Italian battle cruiser, the Vittorio battle, Cru- uh, Littorio battle cruiser. But actually, she fell in a trap uh, done by the fascist uh, sex service. So she was put in jail. Uh, some of her comrades were just shot, and it was she was freed after that. She escaped south, and she spent the rest of the war like she just, just did public walks, and she was not active in the resistance. Okay. In 1947, they tried to arrest her due to her betrayal. She tried to sabotage the fascist war machine of fascist Italy. It was fighting against, you know, the Allies and was doing all those stuff. And so she was prosecuted after that. And she got some kind of amnesty in the late 70s. She lived all her life in France because she escaped. So she lived in exile due to that. So that gives you, you know, an overview on how differently were treated partisans and and fascists. But the main, you know, the main tool they used to do that to keep partisans in prison was to judge most of their actors like ex common criminal, you know, attitude, which were not co- not all of them, but most of them, which were not covered by the amnesty. These are just two examples. But there are thousands of others. An organisation called Democratic Solidarity was set up specifically to defend ex-partisans from legal persecution and dealt with around 20,000 trials between 1948 and 1953, involving tens of thousands of former partisans. But the poor treatment of partisans went beyond just legal harassment for alleged crimes during the war. The harassment of partisans often seeped into their everyday lives, as Elsa Polizzari recalls. Per noi, ne? Per noi partigiani. A commander from Brescia applied to become a veterinario in various towns and put on his application that he had been a partisan. He always came second in the application pool. A man told him, don't put down that you were a partisan, and indeed he applied in another town. He didn't put down that he'd been a partisan, and he was hired as the vet. People thought the partisans had done bad things. They were accused of so many things that weren't true, and honestly... Very few people honoured the partisans. And it was female partisans, despite the vital role they had played in the resistance, which we discussed in part one, who were treated particularly badly. I was an office worker. In the workbook, I had my qualification as an office worker. In Roa Volciano, they had closed the plant because it had been an arms factory, and after the war, they opened it again as a weaving and spinning mill. I went and I asked if I could work again as an office worker. Let me tell you that, yes, they hired me, but not as an office worker. Because I'd been a partisan, staying in the mountain with the men, uh, what knows what I could have gone up to, and I was not worth of staying in an office with the respectable people. That was my first humiliation. It wasn't just from the valley area. This also happened in the cities. The president of the Green Flames told me, she also told me she experienced a great deal of humiliation because she was in the resistance. There was a sentiment that we were lightweight women of easy virtue. That's all we've got time for in this episode. Join us in our final part where we look at how former partisans took justice into their own hands, talk about some armed uprisings and how the resistance is remembered and misremembered today. That's all available now for our supporters on Patreon. We also have three bonus episodes for this series. In the first, we discuss some of our favourite Italian films about fascism and the resistance. In our second bonus episode, we talk about some of the music that came out of the Italian resistance. And in our final bonus episode, we talk more with Davide about post-war anti-fascism and the continuity of Italian fascism from the war to today's government. All of this available exclusively for our supporters on Patreon. It is only support from you, our listeners, which allows us to make these podcasts. 
So if you appreciate our work, please do think about joining us at patreon.com slash workingclasshistory. Link in the show notes. In return for your support, you get early access to episodes, ad-free episodes, as well as exclusive bonus content, discounted merch, and more. And if you can't spare the cash, absolutely no problem. Please just tell your friends about this podcast and give us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. If you'd like to learn more about the Italian resistance to fascism, check out the webpage for this episode where you'll find images, a full list of sources, further reading and more. Link in the show notes. We also really want to thank Carlo Gianuzzi from the Commissione Scuola and Pibrescia and Davide from Cronica Ribelli for all their invaluable help producing this series. We'd also like to thank the National Association of Italian Partisans for letting us use interviews from their amazing Noi Partigiani website, which contains over 650 interviews with participants in the Italian resistance. Links to all of these in the show notes. We'd also like to thank Lillian McCarthy and Davide for their translations, and to our amazing voice actors, Susie, Carlo Gianuzzi, Chiara, Carlo, Giacomo, and everyone at Ampilondra. Thanks also to all our Patreon supporters for making this podcast possible, and a special thanks to Jameson D. Saltzman, Jazz Hands, and Fernando Lopez Ojeda. Our theme tune is Bella Ciao. Thanks for permission to use it from Dischi del Sole. You can buy it or stream it on the links in the show notes. This episode was edited by Tyler Hill. Anyway, that's it for today. Hope you enjoyed the episode, and thanks for listening. Bella ciao.